Welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful Growth Step resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear an original Church Experience worship song. We hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. That was all the hits. Your number one music. Church experience. Church experience. Church experience. Church experience. Top of the charts. Top of the charts. Well, welcome to Top of the Charts. We are taking the messages that you're hearing through the lyrics of the songs of our culture, and we're talking about those specific messages and bringing it back to Jesus. Because, you know, there are a lot of messages being communicated through the songs that we hear as we walk through the malls, as we sit in restaurants, as we drive down the road. And those messages sometimes are very helpful and good, and sometimes they're not so good. But we're going to talk about those messages, what God has to say about those messages we're hearing in the songs. And each week we're going to look at a Billboard Hot 100 song, some of the most popular songs that are being played in our community, in our culture. And every week we're going to bring it back to Jesus. Well, if you are listening online, uh, what we just heard in this room is we just heard the Chainsmokers and Coldplay song, Something Just Like This, and our band killed it. And you know, this song, I like the lyrics of it because it talks about the specific idea that I think a lot of us aspire toward, and that's, that's greatness, greatness. You know, he says, I've been reading about superheroes and people with superhuman gifts, and then he says, and clearly, I'm not on that list. And, and I think that's a tension that we all feel, the, the aspiration for greatness and then the fact that we're not there yet. And that, and that gap is, is pretty significant at times. Well, this idea of superheroes in this song, you know, it's, this is a big theme in our culture these days, right? I mean, we're, we're hearing about all kinds of superhero movies, all kinds of blockbuster movies that, I mean, from Spider-Man to Batman, right? I mean, Thor, Captain America, The Avengers, Incredible Hulk. I mean, there's just so many superhero movies that are big these days, and they're selling hundreds of millions of tickets. These are incredible, huge movies. Why is it? It's because the same reason why we watch the Olympics, because we love to see and experience greatness. There's something inside of us that's drawn toward it. When we see someone doing something great, or we see a great experience, we want to be around it. We want to be a part of it. We want to learn more. We kind of lean in because there's this natural desire inside of us not only to see and experience greatness, but to be great. And, and I'd like to ask you a question. I would love for you to wrestle with this this week. And, and here's the question. It's, it's the first lesson in your notes. It's a, it's a question. It's why do I desire greatness? Why is it? Why do I desire greatness? You know, if you feel like you have that desire inside of you, if I, you know, I want, I want to experience something great in my life. I don't want to live a normal life. In fact, I've not met too many people, if anyone, who set out to say, I just want to live a mundane, common, ordinary life. I, I just, I haven't met those people yet. Most people, they want to do something great. They want to be someone great. They want to have something great in their life. And if you feel that way, you're not the first one. In fact, there was two young guys that had that aspiration to be great, and they recruited their mom. Shout out to my mom who's in the house today visiting from Michigan. And uh, don't stay away from her. I don't want any of those stories getting out from my childhood. So just uh, you know, say hi, then just keep going. Don't talk. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, not about the stories, though. Those are true. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Jesus and uh, two of his followers are talking with their mom. And uh, the mom says this in verse 20. Uh, it says, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? And when he asked that question, can you drink the cup I'm about to drink, what he's talking about is the upcoming suffering that he will experience. See, a lot of people want the privileges, the rewards, but they don't want to carry the responsibility. 
And they were seeking the rewards of greatness, but they didn't want to carry the responsibility of greatness. And Jesus says, you're aspiring to be great, but, but can you drink the cup of suffering? Can you, can you do what I'm about to do to get what you're wanting? And he asked this question, and they respond probably without having any idea what they were saying. They said, we can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, which they would. They would all go on to suffer and be persecuted, many of them executed as well. And he says, but to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten, their followers, his other disciples, heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So the way of the world when it comes to having power, authority, greatness, is to make it about yourself. Lord it over others. Point everything back to yourself. You reap all the rewards and benefits from it. Other people suffer. It's about you. It's about your glory. It's about your kingdom. He says, not so with you. So for followers of Jesus, there's a different paradigm at play. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he says, I didn't, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve others. And if you're going to follow me, that's the way of the kingdom of God. So if you want to be great, there is a way to be great. And that's to become a servant. What he did not do was squash their desire to be great. You know, if, if there was ever a time where Jesus could have said, it's not about being great. Don't aspire to be great, that you should not try to experience greatness. You should not try to do something great with your life. I mean, this would have been the moment. They put it on the T for him, right? They, they, they were aspiring to be great. And, and if there was ever a time for Jesus to say, listen, that's a misdirected desire. You should not try to do anything great. You shouldn't try to be great. This would be the time. But he didn't say that. He said, if, if you desire to be great, and then he doesn't say it's a bad thing. He just redirects the definition of it. He redefines it for them. He says, if you desire to be great, whoever wants to be great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, meaning putting others ahead of yourself, serving others, sacrificing for the benefit of others. He says, this is what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. This is a very different kind of greatness than you find in the world, in the lyrics of the songs of our world seems like a lot of the greatness that we aspire to in our world serves us. And Jesus' kind of greatness serves others. What kind of greatness are you aspiring toward? A greatness that benefits and blesses you? Or a kind of greatness that benefits and blesses the world? It's very important that you distinguish the difference there. If you're not careful, you'll get caught up in the one and neglect the other. The great Christian author Erwin McManus talks about this drive in us to be great. And we're, as we're asking the question, why do I want to be great? He said there's actually competitiveness that's it's actually a good thing. You know, we're kind of taught maybe that, you know, whether it's directly or indirectly, we kind of feel like as we become more spiritual, as we start to follow Jesus, that, that maybe we shouldn't be competitive and, and we shouldn't have that drive to do anything great. And he says there's actually three things you need to reframe as you talk about that competitiveness, that drive in you. But if you get these things right, it's, it's great to be competitive. It's great to be good. In fact, this is the first thing is who are you competing against? Because if you're trying to be great and you're competing against others, like you want to be better than others, you want to put yourself first, you want to get the glory, then it's really about you. But if you're competing against yourself, that's, that's not bad. That's a good thing. If you, you want to be the best version of what God made you to be, you're competing against yourself, that's not a bad drive. For example, you want your doctor, if you're having open heart surgery, to be very competitive. You want him to be really good. In fact, you don't want him to even be good. You want him to be great. You would love for him to be the best in the world. You want him to have a drive as he's studying how to do open heart surgery. This drive in him that says, I want to be the best in the world in this. That's what you want if he's operating on you. If he's cutting you open, you want him to be great. And that's a good thing. That, that's a good drive. But it's, are you competing against others or are you competing against yourself? He says, also, what are you competing for? Are you competing for? Is this drive in you? To make yourself better than others? Is it to build your kingdom? Is it to bring yourself glory? Or is it to bring God glory and to build others and to raise God's kingdom? 
two different motives of the heart that, that God knows, but that may not be so clear to you. It may be driven by selfish motives without under, realizing and understanding it. And three, he says, it's good to be great at something, but you have to understand the definition of greatness. And this is where Jesus' words come into play in Matthew chapter 20 when he says, the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus came to be great, but to serve. And that's how he was great. He came to serve and give his life. And that's what it means to be great. So have you ever desired to be great at something? I have. Like, since I was young, one of the things I've always desired to be great at is I wanted to be a great husband and I wanted to be a great dad. That was kind of like my desire. And I had a setback on that recently. I was uh, at a mall with our family, and it was a little kind of family day, and the kids were kind of running around the store. Jennifer was kind of looking at some things, and, and my little toddler, my youngest daughter, uh, she, I think, was cold, and so she put her hands inside of her little dress, and she was kind of walking around like a robot because she had her hands in her dress, and I just thought it was adorable, so I went up behind her, and I was going to give her a little hug and a kiss. She's my little girl, and, and, and I did. I, I put my hands on her her shoulders and, and I'm having some fun and she was being silly and so she just kind of like leaned forward because dad was holding her shoulders. But somehow in the process of leaning forward and being silly and she's a little toddler and I'm trying to, she slipped out of my hands. But her full body weight was leaning forward. And so she had no hands be, to stop her fault because they were inside her dress. So the full force of her weight landed on her face as her face smacked into the ground. And I looked at her and instantly blood was coming out of her mouth and I told Jennifer, hey, we gotta go clean her up and we went and found a restaurant and got some ice and put some ice on her face and you know, out of all the times our kids have ever been bruised in their mouth, I've never seen any lips get so swollen and purple and big. I mean just, and I just, I felt horrible. Like I did that. I dropped my little daughter like it's like, and I was trying to have fun with her and I was like, okay, that's not so great. Then later that day, same day, not a different day, same day, we, we happened to be up in, in Georgia at the time, and we we're in this little town called Helen, a little mountain town, and they had this river, this cold little uh, river that runs through the town, and we were skipping across rocks that crossed the water. And my boys, they jumped out, and they were crossing the little river, and they were having some fun, and, and my oldest daughter, Kira, she decided to join the boys. And so she hopped out on the rocks, and mom's like, Kira, that's kind of a big jump. I don't know if you should do that. You might want to think about that. And she, she really wanted to do it. And I'm like, well, I'll help her. And so I came behind her, and I'm thinking, I'll just give her a little daddy boost, and she'll make it, you know. And, and, and so she felt my arms around her, and I was thinking, I'm just going to give her a little extra. She seemed like she could do it, and like she wanted to do it. And so I thought, I'll just, just need to give her a little extra gas to get her over. Well, when she felt dad's presence behind her and my hands that I was going to boost her, she thought, well, I don't really need to jump because dad's got this. And I was thinking, I don't need to really boost her much because she's got this, right? So there's a little miscommunication and she jumped out over this creek and, and to the, get to the rock on the other side and I kind of boosted her, but she only kind of jumped and so she like barely made it. Her feet landed on the rock on the other side, but not with enough momentum to stay there, right? So she fell backward on her backside into the cold water, hit the rocks below the water, instantly started crying and threw her tears and her wet body and I'm there in the water now trying to save her like through the tears she's like I should have listened to mommy <laughs> man oh not great right not not great I aspire to greatness but not there have you ever feel that like gap between like where you want to be and then you're not there and you know I, like, we all have those moments but but there is that de desire in us, right? That, that drive to experience greatness, that drive to be great, to be around greatness. You know, this, the lyrics of this song, you know, I was, I was thinking about these superheroes, and he mentioned Spider-Man and Batman, and, and you know, like the, the, the superheroes, the people with superhuman gifts, and clearly I'm not on that list. I'm just, I feel that gap between, and then the whole song comes around, and it's like, well, that's not what you need to you know, to be in this relationship. I want something just like this. I want something real. I want something right. And, and it doesn't have to be superhuman, right? And, and, but there's underneath the surface of the lyrics of the song, it's this drive to want to be great. And as Christian author Henry Nouwen says, you know, at issue here is, is this question. It's to whom do I belong? To whom do I belong? When you think about greatness and wanting to be great and what you want out of your life, it really raises a good question. He says, do I belong to God or to the world? Many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than to God. 
A little criticism makes me angry. A little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits. A little success excites me. Often I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. Have you put a finger on yet where you're getting your value from? When when you want to be great, have you ever thought about what it is that you believe will make you great? This is really important. Think about it. Have you identified what it is that if you get it, you think will make your life great, will make you great? Without realizing it, we can live our entire lives in pursuit of something that will never give us what we actually want. Because we do have this drive to experience, you can call it whatever you want, but I'm just going to call it today greatness, this fulfillment, this, you know, that's, yeah, that. And at times we'll place it in our career. You know, if I could just get a few more promotions... If I could just be considered successful, if I could just make it to the top, then, then I, would, I would be great. But then you get there and you realize that it's still, it's not fulfilling, it's not it. It's, that's, that's not what you really wanted. Or you think, well, if you're single and you're like, if I could just have a great relationship, if I could just have a great family, then, then I would feel great about life. And you get there and it's not perfect, it's still messy, and you're not still who you want to be, and there's this, this, and it's like, that alone wasn't it. Maybe if I just had more, if I just had a little bit more, the elusive more, right? You get a little bit more, and you're like, well, there's somebody else that has a little more, and if I just had what they have, and then we get a little more, and we're like, well, you know, there's still more that I could have, and, it, and it's just, it's endless, and it never, it never does, it never gets to the point of greatness. It's just, that's pretty good, but you know, there's got to be greatness out there, and there's this drive, this, and, and, and Henry now when he's saying it, it's like, you know, who do you belong to? Because if you belong to the world, you're trying to grasp at the things of this world to bring greatness into your life. And so that's why we're so up and down. It's because we'll assign our value. We, we'll feel great if other people feel great about us. Right? You may not even recognize you do this, but if other people feel good about me, then I feel good about myself. I feel value, right? And so, but then the problem is people don't always feel good about you. And you might have to do the right thing sometimes to let other people down. And sometimes other people won't think highly of you. And then if your value, if your identity is placed in how people feel about you, and they don't feel great about you, then you don't feel great. If you find your value in your work and your wealth or whatever it might be and your pleasure, you, you get to the end of those things at times. The economy changes. Your career changes. Ultimately, your health will change. All these things, they, they can break. They can fall apart, and it's not a strong foundation to build on. So if your life is built on these things and your, your hope is that you will be great through these things of the world, you'll never get there. You'll never find the greatness you're actually seeking. Why is that? It's because true greatness is not found in the things of this world. That's not where greatness comes from ultimately. In your notes, I think there's a place we need to get to, and it's, 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 it's a win. It's a space we come to, and here it is. It's, it's a powerful lesson. When we worship God because only he is truly great, that's when we start to understand what true greatness is. When we worship God for who he is, we acknowledge and recognize that only he is truly great. Listen to what a great man of God said about this topic in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. The Apostle Paul, a close follower of Jesus, said, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. So I've had wealth and I've had poverty. I've had a lot, I've had a little. I've had huge ups, I've had tremendous lows. Been on the mountain, been in the valley. Right? I, I've, just been, I've been through all of it. And and he says, whether I've had plenty or whether I've been in need, I know what it is. I have learned the secret of being content, whole, complete, that great feeling. I I know what that means. I've I've gained that. I've grabbed a hold of it. In any and every situation, so in the ups and the downs, no matter what life was like, no matter my situation, I found something that has made me feel content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So it wasn't something, it was someone. And so when I really recognize that my value, my strength, my identity, greatness in my life was not from the things of this world, then I discovered what I actually needed. And that was Jesus. It wasn't all the things that people aspire to in this world. Like those things, those things are not what bring you the greatness in your life. It's, it's Christ. 
You know, interestingly, when you pursue Christ, when you put things in the right order, he gives you those things that you thought you wanted. You know, Matthew, Jesus says, you know, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't the thing that we actually wanted, and he gives it to us, but, but he tends to bless. There's no question his favor tends to fall on those who are righteous who follow him. So when you get things in the right order, God's blessing comes in your life. And you can see this throughout the rise and fall of countries throughout history. Those who honor God and then turn their backs on him. And you, could, you can see that. And certainly, as we talked about suffering the last two weeks, there's times when the righteous perish. There's times when the righteous do good and experience bad. And Jesus and his followers, they understood that well. They lived that out. But in general, if you watch, the blessing of God falls on the righteous. His favor, his blessing but don't pursue God to get his blessing because God sees through our motives. Even when we don't understand our motives, he knows it. So if you're pursuing God to get something from God, like a vending machine, God knows exactly what you're doing. You're trying to press all the right buttons and hoping that you'll get what you really want. And he's like, once you realize that I'm what you really want, then I'm freed up to bless you. Because when you realize that God is what you really need, when you realize that God is what you really want, When you realize that he's the only great thing in this world, there's nothing in this world that is great outside of God. So he's the creator of all things. So even if you would aspire to do something great and you could make an argument that you did something great, it was a creator in heaven that gave you breath in your lungs to live. I didn't choose to be born. I don't know about you. God, God, God allowed that. God initiated that. That's his doing. And so anything great in this world is, is ultimately from him anyway, and he allows it. And so it all flows out of the greatness of God. And really, all the things of this world are not in themselves great. So there's only one thing that's great. And once I get that straight, once I realize who's great, that God is great, then I'm freed up to really follow him. And he's freed up to bless me because he knows that I'm not going to make idols out of these lesser things of this world. But until I get that in proper context and I realize that only God is great, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chase the things of this world to experience some level of greatness. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, man, if I could just get that thing, then I'll, then I'll have a great life. I'll feel great. And God's saying, no, you won't. I could bless it. I could give it to you right now. <laughs> I own the world. I could, I could create it. Bam, I could give you what you're praying for, what you're trying to get, what you're chasing, what you're spending your days and your time and your sweat on. I could just give that to you. But if I gave that to you right now, You'd make a God out of it. You'd worship that. You'd find eventually at the end of your days or when you're done with your days that it wasn't worth living for and giving your life to. So until you understand that I am the only great thing, I'm not really freed up to bless you in the way that I want to. But then ironically, once we realize that God is great, we realize that's all we need. So when God pours in, we just pour out. And we can really serve and add value to others. We can give glory to God instead of seeking glory for ourselves. We can build God's kingdom instead of our own. We can be about God's mission, not coming up with some mission that we conjure up on our own that's of lesser value, we can be about God's. So when we realize, God, you're great, you're greater than anything in this world, and we start to reflect that in worship, and that's what worship is, it's like, and I think it's so important that we come together on the weekend, this is what we do, we, we gather as God's people, and we do it, of course, throughout the week, but we come together at this moment, and we say, all right, God, you're great, and, and we aspire to your greatness, to worship you, to honor you, to give you glory, to recognize, acknowledge who you are, and tell the world about your glory. It is about your glory. God, it's not about us. It's about you, God. And, and as you do that, God's greatness flows into your life, and you recognize who God is. You recognize how amazing he is. And then, and then you start to serve, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many, you can give up your life because you're not holding on to this life. Does that make sense? It's not not like you're holding on to this life anymore because you've kind of surrendered it. You've abandoned the things of this world. You know, what what do you need to abandon? What do you need to let go of, surrender? Is there some things of this world you're grasping onto? Have you, without realizing it, placed your identity in some of the things of this world? Saying, yeah, that's, that's me. That's what really fulfills me. That's what I want. That's what I need. Even good things. Maybe you need to abandon those things and release them to God. Not in the sense of maybe even uh, letting them out of your life, because God, again, a lot of times will bless and give you exactly what it is that you're, you're seeking. And, but, but maybe you need to abandon it in the sense of in your heart, say, that's not what defines me. That's not what gives me my value. My value comes from God. 
And as you find and follow Jesus and you give your life to him and then you live for him and truly live for him, not like a religion, but in a relationship, man, then God's power really starts to flow through your life because you start to serve others. You start to serve God and you're like, it's not really about me. It's not about me like getting attention. It's not about me getting glory. It's not about me. It's, it's really about Jesus. It's about him. It's about what he's done in my life. And you redirect all the praise to where it really goes and that's to God and we're not confused about that. So how do, you, how do you make that shift? If you start to become aware of the fact, you know, I've, even as a Christian, I've been living as if greatness in this world is gonna come from the things of this world. How do you make that shift to realize that only greatness flows from God and any greatness in my life is ultimately gonna flow from him? How do you make that change? How do you make that shift? It's a seismic shift. It's a huge shift. How do, how do you make that? You know, it's a lot like living in a home that's being renovated. Right, you know, they're tearing it up and bringing the new stuff in, but it's not working yet, and it's sitting off to the side, and you're you're pulling out the old, and you're trying to put in the new at the same time, and it's dusty, it's messy, it's dirty, and it's it's under construction. And as long as we live on this life and on this earth, and we draw breath, we're under construction. We're a work in progress, and we can get discouraged with the gap. I'm no superhero, <laughs> as this song would say. But I think in many ways, God's looking at us with a very similar experience that maybe this relationship, this guy and girl, if you will, in this story, you know, I don't need a superhero. I just need, you know, someone just like this. He's saying, you know, what I really need is not for you to show me how great you are, is I need you to trust me with how great I am and how great I can be in your life. And when you surrender to me, when you let me lead you, when you let me renovate you in your life and your heart, then I'll elevate you and take you to, the, to where you really want to be. But you first have to acknowledge my greatness and then you have to allow me to work on you and change you because you're no longer who you used to be. But you're not yet who you wanna be and I can, I can help you take a step. And you know when I pray for you every week, that's, that's one of my prayers I pray for you is that you'll take a step closer to God and to the life that he meant for you to live. And that you'll, you'll take at least one step closer. It's a journey. It's a journey of taking gross steps, one step at a time. So what holds us back? What keeps us from experiencing God's greatness? You know, I, I think a lot of the, the hold back in our life is because of sin. sin. Sin holds us back. It keeps us stuck. Not living according to God's word. God says this is right. And they're like, well, I'm going to do my own thing. And that holds us back. It keeps us stuck. It steals from us. Uh, Emmanuel Ninger. He's an amazing artist, incredible artist, like skills like you can't believe. The year was 1897. He walked into a little convenience grocery store right by his home, and he got some vegetables. He put them on the counter, handed over a crisp $20 bill to the cashier at the register. The cashier has known Emmanuel Ninger for many, many years, knows him very well, likes the guy, and she takes the vegetables, rings them up, gives him the change for the $20, but notices that the ink on the $20 bill is smudging from the moisture on the vegetables. Doesn't say anything. After he takes his change, he leaves the store and she thinks about it. He can't be a counterfeiter. I've known this guy. But $20 is a lot of money in 1897 and she calls the police. The police investigate and eventually get a search warrant for Emanuel Ninger's home, which they raid and they find in his attic where he has a complete shop set up to reproduce and counterfeit U.S. currency. And he is such a good artist that with painstaking detail, he is literally painting these, these bills and using them and purchasing thing, items. He's stealing. He's a thief. And he's an exceptional artist. Well, they, they take, of course, everything they find in the attic. Among the things that they take are three portraits that Emmanuel Ninger has painted. He's an amazing artist. These three portraits go for sale eventually in an auction for $16,000, over $5,000 a piece. And ironically, it took Emmanuel Ninger about the same amount of time to paint these $5,000 portraits as it did to take him to paint these $20 bills. It's true that he was a thief, but the person that he was stealing from was himself. And this is what sin does to you. It, it entices us to do what we want to do, what we've justified in our mind as the right thing, even though it's the wrong thing, and it steals from us. It takes from us. And we think that maybe we're getting away with something, 
and, and maybe no one else knows. Of course, God knows. But we're actually hurting ourselves. We're hurting our potential. And our life will never be great while we're living in sin. We'll never experience the full greatness of God. But as we surrender to God, here's the lesson in your notes, our lives are far greater in Jesus. As we abandon the things of this world, even the, the things that we've attached to, maybe even opinions that are, were off from Scripture that we've allowed to become convictions, I believe this. I think this is right. This feels good. This is the right thing for me to do, even though I know it's wrong in Scripture. When we start to hold on to those things, once we let go of them, we abandon them, and we start to pursue Christ, and we live for Him all out, man, God starts to, starts to bring greatness into our life, and we start to experience a whole other level of greatness in who God is and who we're meant to be and what He wants to do in our life, but it's, it's a very difficult breaking away and breaking apart of the, the sin in our life that's, that's hardened our heart, that's, that's blinded us, that's stolen from us literally life. That's what the devil does. I don't know if you realize this, but in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I've come to give life to the full, but there's an enemy, the devil, who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Which of his strategies is he deploying in your life right now? What's the devil trying to do? Is he trying to steal something from you? Trying to kill? Trying to destroy? Most likely he's trying to do all three. What's Jesus trying to do? He's trying to give you life. And how does he do that? He says, detach from the things of this world that will take from you and receive from me true greatness, which is mine to give. Receive the light that, that overcomes the darkness. Receive the truth that washes out and exposes the lies. You abandon the things of this world that you're trying to hold on to for your value and your identity. You don't have to, I mean, it's so insecure and up and down and the, because we're attached to the things of this world and that's what we think is gonna be. And then it's up and we feel great and it's down and we feel horrible and it's like, no, that's, it's, it's from God. And once we attach to him, we hold on to him, that everything flows out of that. It's the greatness of God and our lives become greater in Christ, in Jesus. That's how our lives become great. That's how we get unstuck. That's how we move forward. But the final lesson in your notes is disobedience brings discomfort. Disobedience brings discomfort. As surely as God blesses the righteous, as surely as God pours into his people with equal reality, those who are disobedient from God, those who turn from God, they experience the pain and discomfort and consequence of sin. It's a reality. So what is it in your life that's not aligned with truth, that's not aligned with scripture, and you're justifying it, you're saying it's okay, it's not a big deal, no one notices, God will be okay with it, when in reality, he's not, and you'll never find greatness, and you'll never experience the life that he has planned for you until you let go of what you're holding on to. It's scary on the edge of surrender, but God has more for you. We were in this little town I mentioned before and there's some shops down the way and we had parked and we're enjoying this family day and um, walked from our car um, across the parking lot up this really long hill, this long street to get to where the shops were, crossed over, went down into some shops and one of my children needed something that they left in the car and so I'm like, well, I'll go get it and I'll come back, you guys keep doing your thing. And so I you know, left the shop, walked down the street, crossed over the road, went around a corner, went down this really long street, downhill, to where our vehicle was parked, went across the parking lot, stood right there next to the vehicle, and then went to grab for the keys and realized, oh man, I left them in Jennifer's purse. I'll often do this. If I'm driving, I'll, I'll, I'll have the keys in my pocket, of course, and then I'll realize as we're walking around, you know, I don't need to have these in my pocket. Jennifer's got a purse. So I'll just say, hey, Jennifer, can I throw them in your purse? And I'll just throw them in there so I don't have them in my pocket. And I got back to the car and I realized that I left them with her. So I walked back through the parking lot, up this really long sidewalk to get back to the road. I turned the corner, walked down the street, found them where they were, got the keys out of her purse, and walked back out of the shop, down the street, around the corner, down this really long road to get back to the car so that I could open it with the key. And then I walked back across the parking lot again, back up this really long street, around the corner, down the road into the shops to find my family. It took up this huge, long amount of time and a lot of effort because why? I was standing in the right place but I didn't have the key that I needed. I didn't have the key that would let me in to get me where I needed to go. And some of us in that gap of like, man, desiring greatness and wanting greatness, but then feeling like there's a lack of, you know, this, this song, it just says it so clearly, you know, 
Clearly, I'm not on that list. You know, he's naming all these superheroes, and, and it's not me. And we're feeling that, like, man, it's just, it's, there's something missing. It's not there. And I, I think that the reason is, is that sometimes we can get it in a, in a place. It might even be the right place, but we don't have the key that unlocks the greatness that God has for us. And that key is one thing, and it's, it's, it's not a something. We th- kind of think that it's going to be this next something, but it's, it's someone. It's, it's Jesus. And it's always the answer, whether you don't know Christ or whether you've been following him for 30 years, it's still the same answer. It's, it's, it just gets deeper and stronger and more powerful and passionate with time. It's, it's understanding that Jesus is great. He's the greatest treasure in this life, worth abandoning everything else to find and grab hold of him. And once I realize how great Jesus is, and I really grab hold of that deep in my heart, that Jesus, you are the greatest thing in my life, then I'm willing to let go of everything else so that I can grab a hold of Christ, and he gives me everything I need. And this is really the, the, the overflow of what Jesus' ministry was. He was the highest. He came to the lowest crucifixion ex- execution so that forever we would see that he's the greatest. So he had everything. He gave it all up. And then in the end, gave all the glory forever for all of eternity. He says, you want to follow me, take up your cross. Be willing to die to yourself, die to the things of this world, die to the things you're trying to hold on to so that you can actually gain true life. And if you, if you worship this world, if you try to hold on to this world, if you try to live for this world, then you, that's, that's going to be all that you get is this life. And you'll actually lose life. But if you're willing to, to give up the things of this world, if you're willing to surrender and abandon everything so you can fully follow Christ, he will give you more than what you can imagine. But it's, it's an issue of trust. Do I trust him? Am I willing to follow him in faith? And it really comes down to one word, and that's Jesus. Romans 10, verse 13 says it so clearly. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone and anyone. Doesn't matter what your past is. Doesn't matter what your beliefs have been. Doesn't matter how far you strayed away. Doesn't matter how long you have been in church, grew up in church, know all about the Bible, know nothing about the Bible. Everybody comes through Jesus. In fact, he said in John chapter 14, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus, recognizing, understanding the greatness of him. And, and he taught, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, abundance, everything and more that you can imagine for those who are willing to see and seek the greatness of God through Jesus, they'll give their lives to him, live for him. There's no greater life. There is no greater life. Because Jesus fully fulfills. He gives you everything that you've ever desired, which is him ultimately. That's it. And if that's all you had, his grace is more than enough. But I found that his blessing, his favor, it comes into your life as you really live for him. He's freed up. And why would he not? Because he can trust you. And then you know what you do is you turn around and, and you find ways for God to use you to bless others, to give yourself away, to raise the value of others and add value to other people. Because it's not about you anymore. So there's this whole redefining of life. And Jesus says, if you desire to be great, Matthew 20, verse 28. If you desire to be great, then then live for the one who truly is great and let his greatness flow through you. He says, be a servant, serve others. Don't let it be about yourself. Die to yourself, live for Christ and you will find true life. Right on. Thank you for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out our website if you would like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered or support this movement financially by giving online. You're now going to hear an original church experience worship song. We hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today.